back to another episode of I Know I Know a Solo Beatles video cast where we talk all things Solo Beatles. Now today, um, we have the only member of Crown Royalty on the po- on, <laughs> that I've had on. <laughs> um, you may know her for her book, which we are discussing today. The songs we were singing guided towards the Beatles' lesser known tracks. Um, and Michael Jackson FAQ, all that's left to know about the King of Pop, and um, Phantom and the Beatles, that actually you've known for all these years, co-authored with one of my favorite people, Ken Womack, one of my favorite Beatles authors. Um, and um, she's also the co-host of um, my, the, I'll give it to you, Tom, the best solo Beatles video cast. <laughs> um, talk more talk. Um, a solo Beatles video cast along with um, Ken Womack sometimes, Ken Michaels, Joe Mayo, and Tom Hanyati. Welcome back, Kit. Oh, thank you, Hudson. It's always a pleasure to be back on your show. And at the, the, the other solo Beatles video cast, <laughs> the other great one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and you recently did a do you want to tell us a little bit about the show that you did last night? Absolutely. We did um, a great show, and we had a, a guest, uh, Al Sussman, who's a good friend of both of ours, a um, longtime fixture in uh, Beatle fan community. He's the executive editor of Beatle Fan. Uh, we did a, a show, uh, we do this periodically, this series called Another Listen, uh, where we take an album that was, at the time of its release, um, you know, commercially and critically may have been, you know, trashed or, or uh, at least did not sell well and is kind of still, a, you know, controversial uh, in the fan community. And we give it another listen and decide, did it deserve the initial reception it got? And so last night uh, we did the episode, uh, the latest installment of this on Ringo's Bad Boy album from 1978. And um, we had a lot of fun and had a good discussion. We had a, a good, vigorous discussion on it. Uh, and uh, the audience really got into it, too. Uh, and, uh, and the episode, uh, it's up on our Facebook page, but I will be posting the episode up on our YouTube channel. And it will be up on virtually any podcasting platform uh, you can think of very soon. Uh, so you'll be able to weigh in on what you think, too. But we we had a lot of fun. Do We always do. We always have a lot of fun doing another listens because, you know, there are some people that are firmly, you know, firmly defend the album. There are others who say, nah, they got it right the first time. And, uh, and we just we love doing another listens. Yeah, it, it's probably my favorite series that you guys do, do. Mm. And, well, well, and we'll be doing plenty more. Good. And I'm, and you kept the bad boys in line. Yes, I did. The bad boy boys. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, if I was Ken's temporary replacement, oh, he would have failed. <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah, Ken, uh, Ken Michaels uh, uh, couldn't join us last night, uh, but and, and want to send our best uh, wishes out to him. His wife is recovering from surgery, recovering extremely well, thank goodness. And yeah. so he uh, and uh, so he was uh, not uh, able to join us last night. He is going to be back for the next episode. And uh, so and, and he will be able to give his rebuttal. In fact, we heard from him right after the show last night. <laughs> I bet you got a long, <laughs> angry messages. And he said, I want time to give my rebuttal uh, in the next episode. We're like, fine, Ken. We will. You will. Absolutely. <laughs> I can guess that letter. That message was really long. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He, and he said he enjoyed it. He said he enjoyed the episode, but he said, I want time to give my, my rebuttal. We're like, fine. No problem. Oh, uh, but it was it was a lot of fun. So uh, so yeah, look for that. Uh, that will be up on um, excuse me YouTube and um, all the podcasting platforms this week. So uh, so look out for that. So going into the book, first of all, I want to step way way back into when did you realize you wanted to be a writer, Kit? Oh gosh, um, 
I've I've wanted to be a writer since I I was uh, even like in grade school. I I remember um, I used to um, my and my parents still kid me about this. I even like made up my own newspaper when I was a kid. I re- I even remember it was called News Teller Newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name. Yep, news teller. And I would uh, write up, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I don't know what the, I don't remember what the burning news items I was writing about, probably the bunnies in our yard or something like that. But, um, <laughs> but the chaos you know, of creation in the backyard. Exactly. Chaos of creation, which, you know, which I'm, I'm, I'm in right now and I, I still love. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I, I've always loved writing and and you know i would write scripts you know for puppet shows and things like that i mean i just always loved it um and then you know as as time went on i mean i just uh loved uh you know writing uh you know english was always my favorite subject and i think i remember learning i thought oh yeah all right <laughs> and i remember learning what words you know what writing could do to affect people when I was a senior in high school, I was the editor of the school paper, and I had written an editorial, uh, or actually not an editorial, it was a, a concert review, and it was the first time I saw Paul McCartney live um, in 89, and uh, at uh, uh, the then it was uh, called the Rosemont Horizon in, uh, in uh, Rosemont, Illinois, where, uh, very close where Best for Beatles fans is held today. And, uh, and of course, I was so excited to, to see him live, as, as you can imagine. And I wrote this, uh, this review of the concert and, and not only about the concert itself, but talking about, you know, what it was like to see a Beatle live, you know. And after that was published, a teacher, um, one day you know, I was going to class and walking to class and this teacher came along who I really didn't have for classes and said, you know, pulled me aside, said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I thought, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, what did I do? And he pulled me aside and he said, I read that piece that you wrote. And he said, I just had to tell you, um, it brought me back to when I was back in 1964, when I was a fan and I was a teenager. And he said, I, I just loved it. And he, and he said, you brought me back to my youth. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that, that piece. And for the first time, it was kind of like, oh, you know, something I wrote affected, you know, somebody and, and really moved them in some way. And, you know, that made me think, huh, you know, I wonder if somehow I could do this for a living. But I then ended up, I, I did major in uh, communications in college, but then I, I kind of went on a detour. I thought I'd teach writing uh, for a while. Um, but then when I finished uh, my doctorate in instructional technology, I decided to take a break uh, and uh, decide whether I wanted to pursue academia uh, permanently. And I started keeping a blog um, and was writing about music which has always been kind of my first love. It's always been the background. I'd been writing for, you know, uh, different music publications just for fun. And, and long story short, uh, I ended up uh, finding out about this site called Black Critics, uh, which is still around, and um, thought, you know, just for fun, maybe I'll apply for a job there, you know, writing about music. So I did, got the job, and... That gradually led to the Michael Jackson book, um, you know, that I wrote an article on there about Michael Jackson. Um, and Robert Rodriguez, who I'd already known anyway, uh, we all know him, you know, uh, uh, he's the uh, head of something about the Beatles podcast. He's written a number of Beatles books, recommended me uh, for the, this uh, series FAQ. They were looking for someone to write about Michael Jackson, and I'd written this piece about him, and they said, you know, hey, why aren't you auditioned for this? So it was kind of like a one thing led to another, led to another. Um, You know, then I left Blog Critics, went to something else reviews, started writing the Deep Beatles column, um, which I'd always wanted to do. 
I uh, wanted to write a Beatles column, and they let me go to it. Um, and so I did that, um, and then that gradually led to other opportunities. So while I still kind of have one foot in academia, um, you know, that I, I do, you know, my presentations, I still write articles, I, I present at academic conferences, I'm able to combine it with my hobby, which I never thought I'd be able to do. I mean, I, you know, be able to make it my job. I mean, you know? And you get to sit in your backyard and do work. That's the and, best. And, ex and exactly. I get to sit in my backyard and do work. I, mean, I, I got, you may you know, have to worry about Ken Womack with his bunny hat running through. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, really. So it's it's just it's just weird, you know. Life. That's what I've learned, you know. Life takes twists and turns, you know. You think you're on track to do one thing, and then life throws these curveballs at you, and uh, and you end up doing other things. So really, I I had no intention, never thought that my interest in music would be my career. I thought this was just going to be a hobby, and uh, look what happened. <laughs> yeah. So moving on to the next question, what was your first Beatles book that you ever read? Now, OK, this is going to be a little controversial, but I, I, I have an explanation. Um, it was a Jeffrey Giuliano book. OK, oh, now that's a swear now, word. <laughs> yes. Now, it was a book. It was a non-controversial book. First of all, I had no idea who he was at the time. I was around, probably around your age when I got it. Maybe, yeah, maybe 14, 15 when I, when I got it. And it was called, I looked it up last night so because I, I was trying to remember the name of it. Uh, it was called, I think, Beatles A Celebration. And it was mainly about memorabilia. So it was not really a controversial book. Okay. And yep, and I loved looking at the memorabilia. I remember this. I, I would sit and look at all the, you know, there there were some I, I mean, I will say this. It was a great book for that. I mean, there was some I mean, he must have had a, a really good memorabilia collection because I remember seeing pictures of like the flip your wig game and you know and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and and it was just basically a general background about the Beatles story. I mean, I don't remember it being like super controversial. And it came out in about eighty six, uh, from what I could tell. I was looking up the precise publication date. So. Yes, it was a Jeffrey Giuliano book. I didn't know who he was at the time, but it was not one of the, like, really, you know, um, shall we say, or, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, let's put it that way. I'm not, a, I, I know I'm banned for saying that name on yeah. certain podcasts. <laughs> so, so I wanted to say that, but, but, an, but a little explanation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was a long time ago <laughs> and I moved on to other people <laughs> good you found your way <laughs> I found my way <laughs> you looked for your left and right and you never closed in your <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <laughs> you got it <laughs> yeah but the pictures were great. The pictures were, were real. They were good. The, the good. pictures. Yeah, great memorabilia pictures. <laughs> um, so moving on, we kind of already discussed that. Um, what, what, how did you get your gig at Beatle fan? Well, this was uh, this was an interesting story. I, um, you know, this was like in 90. Oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, probably it was around 95, something like that. Um, I was, uh, so I was, yeah, I was in grad school at the time and the internet, I know this is, this is, you know, I'm really dating myself here. So, so bear with me, Hudson. Um, the internet was, you know, kind of new. Um, you know, like I had not encountered email or anything until about that time because a lot of schools like my when I was in college we didn't have email uh, we barely had the internet then I mean this was, was from dial up yeah exactly I mean this was this was like old school you know 
90 to 94, I, I was in college. And yeah, we didn't, we didn't have, uh, you know, email and, and really the only internet that anything close to it at my school, I was at a small uh, school, was like at the library, there were certain databases you could access, you know, but, but that was about it. I mean, it was pretty basic. Um, I mean, there was a friend of mine who was at University of Illinois at Champaign, and they were kind of ahead of the curve on email. And she would say to me, you know, hey, we could communicate via electronic mail. I mean, that's what it was called then. And I'd be like, what's that? You know, I mean, that's that's how basic it was. When I got to, uh, when I was working on my master's degree at DePaul University, um, they finally said to all of us, you have to have email. And, and they gave us software. Uh, where we could, uh, you know, like a whole pa- package with Netscape. That was the, that was the browser, uh, and it was dial-up. You're right. I mean, it was. I mean, it was really basic. So I was learning about all this stuff, and I was pretty fascinated by it. I mean, I've always been kind of fascinated by computer stuff. So around '95, uh, Bill King, the editor of Beetle Fan, put out um, a call for people to apply. Um, to start uh, to write a column for Beetle Fan about Beetle sites on the internet. This was brand new. I mean, you know, sites were just starting to to to, to turn up on the internet. Now, when I say, and, and this is one thing I've really loved about doing this job all these years later, because I've really gotten a front seat to see how they've developed all these years because the first Beatles sites were so basic. I mean, cause yeah, cause it was dial up. You couldn't have big time graphics. No. <laughs> I mean, it's you like, know, you'd have like the driving rain cover. That's basically yeah, exactly. Happening. It was kind of like that. I mean, you know, it was, I mean, these were the days where you did, you know, you would uh, load up a site and you'd, you'd go to your, you know, go to the kitchen, make a sandwich and then come back and hope the site had loaded up. I mean, it was like that, you know, so a lot of it was just text and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so this was a new kind of thing. So, uh, so Bill was looking for um, a columnist to, this was going to be their beat, you know, was to keep track of the sites. So I thought I was just starting to get into this whole world. And so I'm like, you know, I, 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 I want to do it because I've been a subscriber Beatle fan for a while and I really wanted to be a writer. And I thought this is my way in. And yeah. so <laughs> I'm like, I can do this. So I applied. And so I think maybe a couple of other people, you know, auditioned um, and I won <laughs> and I got the job. And so I've been writing ever since, um, all these years later. And as I said, it's, it's been so cool to see how these sites have developed. Steve Mirnucci's uh, new site was one of the first I ever reviewed. Um, and uh, it was Abbey Road, I think it was called Abbey Road uh, News Site, something like that. And it was all text. Um, but that was one of the first I ever reviewed, and it was one of the best of, the, of its time because it was all news, and, you know, that's where you got it uh, yeah. back then. Which is and, crazy know. to imagine. It really is. Yep, and, uh, and of course, no social media. I mean, that was unheard of. Um, and, uh, and really, George Harrison's site in 2001 when the All Things Must Pass um, you know, anniversary edition came out that, uh, and you can still find it, I think on the Wayback machine, that was a gigantic leap forward, uh, technologically. I mean, they really put a lot of work into that site with animation, flash animation and everything. I mean, that was, that was a gigantic leap, leap forward and, and all the other Beatles sites really then like, you know, Paul's and Ringo's they started putting way more work into their sites after that. Cause that was, that was like, I, I remember reviewing that and saying, you know, wow, you know, this is amazing. You know, this is, this is like the future, you know, there's a 480p <laughs> pixel picture. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I mean, probably today it wouldn't look like anything special, but in 2001. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a, a big deal. So, uh, so yeah, so that's how I ended up. And now I write other stuff too, uh, for, for Beetle fan. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but that's, that's how I started. 
Yeah, and that's that's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. What's your favorite Beatles book now? Oh, gosh, I think I have to go with the classic uh, Mark Lewis and uh, Beatles recording sessions. I refer to that book all the time. When I wrote my... Um, my book, you know, uh, all, all my columns, which became songs we were singing. I mean, I, uh, that book is so dog-eared. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I refer to it all the time. I mean, I love many of his other books too, but that's the one that's like my, my Bible when it comes to research. Um, it's, it says, and I know he has said that, you know, he made some mistakes in it and all, but it's still to me, the go-to. Um, and, uh, and he's written so many other wonder tune in, of course, and can't wait for his other two, uh, whenever, whenever they, whenever they arrive. But, uh, but I, I just, that one to me was such like, I mean, I, when I got that book back in, oh gosh, I, I probably was maybe a senior in high school or something when I first got that book, that was just, I would pour over that. Um, and I, I just, to this day, I, I, you know, it's it's my go-to. I love it. Yeah, I haven't read that book yet, but that's on my go list. I, I was surprised when I saw heard Lewis, and I was surprised you didn't say tune in. That, yeah, that yeah, has I, become most people's bible. You know, and and that's wonderful too. I it mean, is. it really is. But for like the complete, because because that's for a certain time period, of right? Course. Um, and it's wonderful, no question. But for just pure research, I mean, I've got to give it to to recording sessions because, as I said, my copy is dog-eared. <laughs> I mean, it is beaten up because I've used it so much over the years. So, like, if I had one Beetle book, like, if, you know, the, the whole, if you were, were on a deserted island and you could only take one book with you, that'd be the one for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thankfully, Eight Arms to Hold You is a PDF. Yes, exactly. That'd be tough. <laughs> a $200 book. Yep. <laughs> Very dog. Thank God I... Thank God I bought that book years ago before it, uh, yeah, before it went up. Because yeah, ouch. <laughs> so um, now I'm gonna actually divide this into two questions. Okay. Um, this is the hard question, I think. Uh -oh. Who is your favorite Beatle when it comes to the group? Oh man, it's it's really tough, but. I guess I'd have to go with Paul by by a very slight, slight margin. I I, I guess I've always been kind of uh, a Paul person because, you know, he he just um, you know, for for his versatility, um, you know, he really. I mean, I mean, George and John have great versatility too, but but uh, you know, he just has. Such, I mean, he can do it all. I mean, he's he can do. I mean, he's got that wonderful, you know, hard rock kind of voice. But of course, he can also do ballads. Um, uh, Sergeant Pepper, you know, was was basically his concept. Um, the Abbey Road medley um, was, you know, a great deal of it. His concept. Um, I I just um, tend to be drawn a bit more to him i mean not to put down george or john at all because i love their stuff too don't don't get me wrong but i guess for and, and in his solo career too for for versatility i guess i'd have to go with paul but that's a tough one i'm gonna now be a pain I, your answer is probably going to be the same just for the solo years that all four of them were alive who was yeah. your favorite Oh man, I, I guess, I guess again, I'd have to go with Paul, but boy, slightly over George. Just Thank slightly, you. Slightly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because boy, that's close. Because George, man, all things must pass. I mean, uh, that's that's been an album that's meant so much to me. You know, and and it's that's so hard. And and George did so many great albums too. I just you know I wish he'd had 
he had done more, you know. Um, but uh, we'll be talking about one of his albums in, in a little while. But um, but yeah, I would say Paul by just a very slight margin. Yes. So we've kind of discussed a little bit about the songs we were singing. Do you want to kind of elaborate how it came about with all sure. the columns? Like sure. The- well, you know, I, I really what I was doing was, you know, I wanted to write, I, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to write about the Beatles because let's face it, a lot has been written about them. <laughs> a lot. And so I thought, what can I add to the conversation? And I, I was trying to figure out what my niche would be. And so I then thought, well, what about talking about the songs that are the, the lesser known, as I call them, not the unknown, because some people have said to me along the way, well, there are no lesser known tracks. Well, I argue there are, that, that they're the ones that, you know, they weren't the big hits, um, you know, they're the ones that they're the album tracks, the B sides, some of the songs they never perform live. And sure, to the hardcore fan, maybe they're not quotes lesser known. But I feel like there are some songs that tend to be, you know, kind of dismissed, even in some Beatle books, some other Beatle books that I've read. They, I will agree with that. Yeah, that they tend to be just kind of tossed off in a couple of sentences. And that I feel they deserve more attention. And they tend to be kind of, you know, dismissed in, in terms of describing what, you know, where they fit into the Beatles' de- artistic development. You know, they ca- tend to be written off as filler or something. So that's the challenge that I presented myself. And so that's became the concept for Deep Beatles. Um, you know, where I would argue some of these these tracks and even, you know, argued like Mr. Moonlight, which everybody loves to, you know, put down. OK, I thought, all right, I'm going to argue my case of, you know, why, you know, why should we wh- what is there that we can defend about Mr. Moonlight? You know, things like that. So uh, so that became my column. And so I wrote so many of these that I then thought, you know what, I think I've got a book here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, also, when I was at Block Critics, which I mentioned earlier, I wrote a ton of Beatles stuff about, uh, about uh, there, too, um, and solo stuff. And a lot of that material you can no longer find on Block Critics because uh, they've since changed ownership and they purged a lot of the really old stuff off there. So now the only place you can find my stuff I wrote on Block Critics is in that book. Uh, it's in that book. So, yep. So that's yeah. it. You, you know, it's no longer on the internet. You can only find it there. And there's a lot, uh, a lot there that I wrote. Um, and, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about in just a few minutes, but, um, and, uh, so I thought, I think, I think I've got a book. And so that's what I did. And I also wrote an exclusive chapter, um, where I talk about Ringo and underrated drumming performances. Cause we all, you know, we all hear about the great, uh, you know, the drum solo we had in the end and that kind of stuff and, and all that. I mean, yes, w- and wonderful. We, we love hearing that. But I also write about some other performances that I think he doesn't get enough credit for because they might be a little more subtle, you know. So, uh, so yeah, so it was really fun, you know, getting the material together for this book and, and to, you know... Um, just just gather it all together to say, you know, these are the songs we were singing. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. That gave me time to get my uh, get my book out here, so no worries. <laughs> it gave me all time to yeah to pull pull the book out, so no worries at all. <laughs> awesome. So, 
I want to move on to the song discussions. All right. So I, I don't think we're going to have time to discuss all of them that I pulled out. But yeah. first of all, let's start with um, Don't Bother Me. Okay, absolutely. Why yeah. did this scream overlooked to you? Well, you know, people tend to, in, including George, by the way, you know, I found a, an interview with yeah. him where he, yeah, where he said, oh, you know, this is this was just kind of a, you know, this was his first. Yeah, I think he just kind of wrote it off because, oh, this was his first attempt. And and um, and he just sort of wrote it off as, you know, yeah, this was my first song that I got. On. It wasn't that great. And, you know move on well okay yes it, and i'm not saying it was while my guitar gently weeps <laughs> i mean you know it, it it wasn't but i think it it does have uh, it is significant first of all because yes it is the first uh george harrison composition that made it um onto a record but i think it also has some it it, it portends some other um, elements that were on uh, Beatles records. First of all, it has that that kind of Latin um, element to it and that, that percussion. Um, and this is something that they were fascinated with since their Hamburg days. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and would continue doing, I mean, like, you know, even back when, like, Besame Mucho, I mean, even, you know, before yeah. that, or P.S. I Love You, um, you know, they used it. They would continue to do it on "And I Love Her," "I Feel Fine." Um, so this was not their first, um, you know, brush with uh, with Latin, um, uh, you know, Latin rhythms. But also, you know, this also would portend, you know, uh, George's continuing fascination with integrating world music with rock. As we all know, he would continue doing that, particularly with Eastern. Um, Eastern music, um, but uh, he, you know, this is sort of his first taste of that um, right. with the, with that. So, and and obviously he would even go further into that in his solo work. So you see, you know, in just this composition, just that first uh, little taste of that. Um, also, you see his the lyrics in this. Now you can see, say, you know, oh, they're very pessimistic and all. Well, and and yes, they are. But they're also kind of characteristic of, of what became uh, George's songwriting. They're, they're biting, uh, you know, certainly. Um, you know, he's talking about, um, I, I think this was kind of a, you know, he never was that comfortable with fame. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, he certainly, uh, got tired of being, uh, you know, the mob scenes of Beatlemania, um, you know, and certainly this song kind of alludes to that. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think he, um, you know, I, I think this is a, a clue of where he was going to go in some of his songwriting. It wasn't going to be all, you know, she loves you and, you know, typical just love song material. He was, this was very personal um, and, and yes, a bit more pessimistic. Um, you know, he would explore some kind of darker themes and a little bit of humorous wordplay and, you know, only a Northern song, Tax Man, Piggies, um, yeah. you know, uh, in his solo stuff, this song, Sue Me, Sue You Blues, Devil's Radio. I mean, you know, so while this may not have the sophistication of some of those other songs, this is the first inkling we see of it in, uh, in Don't Bother Me. So, you know, so I think while you can say, well, this doesn't rise to the level of some of his later compositions, this is a first, very important first step for George in terms of his lyricism and also that first kind of experimentation with, you know, world rhythms, world music rhythms. So I felt it was important to, to note that. I'll agree with that. It's probably my favorite song on with the Beatles. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, I don't say this a lot, but I'm not as big of a fan as Paul, of Paul's Beatle material as mm -hmm. I am of his solo career. Interesting. That is why, a, why is that? Um, 
I don't love Granny music, and I feel like he got more sophisticated um, in his solo career. Yeah, I mean, he did certainly get, like, on Ram and all, more experimental. That's that's true. Yeah. Um, I'll agree with that, but... Mm-hmm. Def- yeah, I agree with that pick. Mm-hmm. Now, moving on to this song. This may be the most overlooked Beatles song. Run for Your Life. Yep. <laughs> this now, you know, was interesting. When I when I decided to write about this, I thought, wonder if I'm going to get a lot of backlash for this because this song has become, uh, you know, controversial, shall we say, <laughs> in, in recent years. And yes, uh, the, the lyrics are a bit jarring today. Although, uh, of course, you know, some people don't know that that I'd rather see you dead little girl than to be with another man. That was actually a line from an Elvis song. If, uh, they, you know, if, if Elvis had sung that, that, that would, it, it would have been given away, which I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, it was from Baby Let's Play House. So, so you know, John didn't write that line. Um, and, you know, and actually, um, a, a station in uh, Ottawa banned the song in 1992 uh, for, for the lyrics. Um, yes, certainly. Uh, and, and Paul later called it, I think it was uh, uh, when he was interviewed um, in the book many years from now, he called it a pretty macho song. Uh, yes, uh, you know, the, the, the lyrics didn't age well. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and yes, as a woman, uh, the, the lyrics make me cringe a bit. But the song itself, um, actually, I mean, there are a lot of great things to say about it. The harmonies on this are excellent. Um, you know, those, those patented tight harmonies that uh, the, the, the Beatles were, were just so good at. Um, you know, particularly in the lines, you know, describing... Um, you know, about the, the, the girl should run and hide to avoid the narrator's wrath. Um, John's lead on this, his uh, lead vocal, is also one it's of one his... Of his it, it's up with him. It's Only Love is one of his best vocal performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he really, you know, uses his voice so well on this, like the slight roughness uh, of his voice on certain lines, uh, you know, adds to kind of the sinister you know, connotations of, of, uh, the words, you know, um, I mean, you know, how just, you know, blending in just an ominous tone about how he can't spend the rest of his life forcing, you know, his lover to obey his wishes and that line, you know, and I mean, every word I say, <laughs> yeah, you, you believe it. Um, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, uh, also, uh, the, the percussion on this is excellent, but the, I mean, the tambourine weaving in and out, um, you know, taking the place of a harder drum beat, um, I think works, uh, extremely well. Um, I, and then the, uh, returning to the, you know, at the end of the opening verse and the final return to the chorus, and then the, uh, one kind of, um, uh, sort of half scatting. Uh, as the song fades out, um, the, and just sort of it, it, the the whole arrangement itself, it, that it's uh, sort of contradictory. That here you get these kind of you know these sinister you know dark sounding lyrics, and yet the tune itself is so bouncy. It <laughs> that, is. You know that that if you you know weren't listening closely, you know you, you'd be kind of tapping your foot and you know snapping Same along. Same with girls' school. Yeah, exactly. But then you listen to the lyrics, and it's new. Know, whoa! <laughs> so, um, so it's a it's a very intriguing um, song, and uh, that it's actually you know very well arranged. Uh, the harmonies are are just you know the those great tight Beatles harmonies. Uh, great lead vocal performance, uh, very effective from from John. Um, you know, are the lyrics a bit problematic? Sure. You know, of course they are. But the song itself really shouldn't be overlooked because of that. Um, you know, I mean, if you can get past the lyrics, it's it's actually, a, I think, a great song. Um, and and really shouldn't be just, just swept under the carpet because of the, the problematic lyrics. Right. And 
yeah, so the next song I want to talk about is actually a McCartney solo song, Little Willow. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. Written about, um, I think her name was Maureen Starkey. Correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, Ringo's uh, Maureen, first wife. Yes, Maureen Cox, um, uh, her uh, maiden name, and, and Maureen Starkey, yes. Um, yeah, she had passed... Um, during the recording of uh, the Flaming Pie album, and uh, and apparently Paul and Linda had remained very close to her and and, and the whole family, and uh, and were very, um, you know, were were quite af- uh, affected when uh, when she died, and uh, so Paul wrote this this haunting, uh, beautiful song uh, for her. Although it's interesting when you listen to it now. Um, you know, obviously not long after Flaming Pie came out, Linda passed. And so you tend to listen to this song now and almost associate it with Linda uh, as, as much as Maureen, even though it wasn't written um, for, uh, for Linda. Um, this is just a great example of, you know, Paul McCartney at his best um, in, in terms of, you know, writing a beautiful me- uh, melody simple and you know keeping it simple um and just just such touching touching lyrics um and uh, jeff lynn uh produced this uh and did uh really uh, such a uh, just had such a light touch on this just as he should have um you know and, and which he isn't always known for doing but he kept it yeah. light you know, but he kept it light just as he should have. Uh, Paul played most of the instruments on this track. Uh, you know, bass guitar, acoustic guitar, um, uh, Spanish. Um, you know, he really kept it mainly um, acoustic. Um, and Jeff Emmerich was the uh, was the engineer on this, which is kind of a kind of a nice uh, nice Beatlesque uh, touch. Um, and obviously, Paul's voice is, is foremost in uh, in the mix, and the lyrics are, are just so touching. You know, it's about coping with you know difficult circumstances. You know, meeting life's challenges and and dealing with the fact that you know we don't have control over everything, um, right. and that um, and I think it's beautiful that not only is he addressing Maureen, but he's addressing her family, you know, those that are left behind after a loved one is gone and that only time will heal their wounds. I mean, you know, it's, it, who can't relate to this? And it's, it's just, uh, and that, you know, but that love will, you know, kind of an all you need is love message in a way that that love will heal all wounds. It's, it's I think, one of his best solo uh, songs. I mean, I love Flaming Pie, the album, but this is is one of the standout tracks from it, and and I really wanted to highlight that uh, when I wrote about it. Just gorgeous. Interestingly enough, I think I read that or heard it on a podcast that people think that Paul was writing that for himself a little bit too in advance because he knew Linda was gonna die very soon. Yeah, you can, and and I can see that argument because it is a very kind of consoling song that you know he is sort of writing about that, that about you know coping with life challenges, and as I said, you know accepting that you can't control everything. Um, it it is it is just so stunning, and uh, it, as I said, I I think uh, you know should go up there with some of his great great compositions. I will agree with that. So moving on to a Ringo song, Way to the World. This yep, should now, have been a number one. <laughs> Let's just get out of get that out of the way. I'll tell you, and, and people who have, have listened to some of my interviews and, and listened to me on Talk More Talk will know I am a huge defender of this song and a huge advocate of the song. You are right. This should have been a much bigger hit than it was. I remember when this first came out and I, I instantly loved it. And it is a mystery. You know, I guess it was because, you know, the, the, the album, you know, Ringo was signed, you know, this was supposed to be his comeback. And unfortunately Ringo was signed to a small label 
And I think the label just couldn't afford a big, you know, push for this single and this album because this should have this should have been a much bigger hit and a much bigger success than it was. Because I think this this single is right up there with some of his best, you know, with Photograph, It Don't Come Easy. This was just, I think, he had all the makings of, of a hit. He was in terrific voice, a uh, great producer, Don was. Um, I'm a big fan of his, and, and his group was, was not was. Um, from uh, from the 80s um the lyrics you know maybe maybe the lyrics were a little too serious for some people i don't know um i thought they were beautiful and were kind of very apt for what ringo was going through which was you know he was just coming out of a, a decade where he was going through rehab and and you know very difficult time and, you know, the lyrics of this have to do with, you know, letting go of your past and then letting go of your burdens to move on to the future. Um, I, I mean, you know, kind of a serious subject, but ultimately a positive message. I mean, I, I mean what's wrong with that? Um, and uh, the, the arrangement was, was perfect. I mean, it, it really was a, a terrific single. And uh, and really should have been should have been the, the comeback hit that Ringo deserved, um, and I think it just suffered from a lack of promotion. I I really do. Yes. So now I want to move on. This will be my last question. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, time is not very nice sometimes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I want to just talk about the. 2009 remasters coming from those 87 mixes and i i'm a vinyl person so i don't own any of those 87 mixes but let's just say i have heard very bad things <laughs> i'll tell you um yes as yeah as someone who experienced this whole thing the 87 mass uh, uh cds sounded like they were remastered in a tin can I mean, it was, they were awful. Um, they were all they ha- we had at the time. Um, it, it was, you know, uh, they were just uh, sounded like they were done in a rush. Um, and, you know, and to be fair, the technology wasn't there in 1987 that we have now. So, I mean, I, you know, I guess you have to be, you have to be somewhat fair. But uh, there were a lot of, there was a lot of controversy about some of them were in mono, some of them weren't. Um, they, as I said, they were kind of done in a rush. Um, the, the source tapes um, were not in great quality. I mean, it was, it, it really, um, and, and at, at Be- um, Beatle fan at the time, boy, the letters that people sent in um, saying the bass channels were switched. And I mean, it, it was a disaster. And it took way too long for the 2009 remasters to come out. And I remember when I saw the Cirque du Soleil show Love back in 2006. And they, of course, had that album that they uh, that Giles and, and George Martin took part in, in remixing. And I mean, that was a one-off thing. They were almost like um, mashups and the whole thing. But remastering was involved in that. And I remember sitting in that theater and... The theater, of course, did have incredible speakers. And so, I mean, it was a different kind of listening situation. But I remember sitting there thinking, my God, this is what the music should sound like. Because we were still stuck with those 87 uh, mixes. And to hear that, you just thought, God, when are those, when are they ever going to remaster that catalog? Because this is what it should sound like. I mean, I heard sounds, some some vocals and all that I'd never noticed before. And so finally in 2009, they, you know, they gave us what we had hoped for. And uh, you'll read in my book, I, I did um, articles at the time um, on that and did some AB comparisons and the comparisons were incredible. Um, you know, particularly on like tomorrow never knows. I remember just being blown away. I mean, there was just no contest. Um, I mean, the 2009 
remasters, I mean, just cleaned up all the muddiness of the, of the, um, you know, 1987, I mean, clarified so much. Um, you know, it's just a shame we had to wait that long. Um, I mean, way too long. And yes, part of it was the technology wasn't there. I, I don't know. I think it was probably more than that, but, uh, but it was, I'll tell you, I'll tell you Hudson, when, when that, those came out, I mean, fans were just like, we were just stupid excited <laughs> because we were stuck with those awful originals for way too long. <laughs> so the excitement was off the charts. <laughs> so, Kit, I want to thank you for coming on the show again. Oh, thank you. This was so much fun. I always love coming on. And you'll be back to the best solo Beatles podcast. <laughs> hey, we're both. These are both great. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> um, so um, you can email me at I know I know podcast at gmail dot com. Um, I do want to just quickly mention that I my episode with Martin Quibell of Pods Like Us is up, and I did link that in the description. And I will be appearing on Paul or Nothing soon. So I want to thank you all for listening and peace and love.